special guest uh, just to make a, a brief cameo here. My, my wife, my creature, is able to uh, get away for a minute. She's going to uh, go back downstairs and be with our older son who's uh, over here for a little while visiting from his place. But I want you all to meet her and see that she's Hi. real, a real person. And so... <laughs> Hey, Long Beach <laughs> brothers and sisters. Great to be here. Great to meet you guys. <laughs> so, there you go. Amen. So I'm glad that I'm glad that you could uh, you all could see her and she could see you for a minute. Um, and so, uh, but it's been it's been great to be with you all. Um, and I, I think this is our fifth week together. So. You know, um, kind of got used to it. I was thinking of pledging membership in the Long Beach Church, but um, you know, I think I think that qualifies. Um, but so tonight, as as we continue, you know, we've okay, we've talked about um, you know the the being the our purpose and being the image bearers of God, the mission to gather the nations the uh, task to be all things to all people and the covering of love. And then, uh, you know, last week we talked about the, the challenge of cultural humility. And I, I want to take my last opportunities here with you all this week and talk about some of the obstacles that we face in coming together. Uh, you know, culture itself, <clears throat> excuse me, can become an obstacle and some of the challenges, but I want to highlight some specific ones in a, in a church that can, you know, even more than some of the just regular ones, the way we communicate or our views of authority, some of those things, but I want to highlight some of the big ones that can serve as obstacles if we don't address them and continue uh, over time to be aware of these things within a church. <clears throat> Excuse me. And obviously, um, you know, miscommunication, misunderstanding can be a big problem in a church. And we see that in the biblical text, perhaps nowhere more clear or nowhere clearer than in Joshua 22, where the Israelites have started to, uh, you know, engage in the process of settling down in the promised land. And the two tribes, two and a half tribes, go across the Jordan where they're to settle. And as soon as they get across the Jordan, they built this big altar. And the other tribes hear about it, and they're like, oh, no, idolatry. We've got to go to war. And so they amass an army, and they start to go to war against these other two and a half tribes. And when they arrived, they're like, how could you do this? How could you so quickly abandon us and God and go to idolatry? And the two and a half tribes say, no, 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 that, that's not at all what happened. We put this up here, not for sacrifices or burnt offerings, not as an, a, another or an alternate to the, to the main altar. This here is a witness so that down the road, if those of you on the other side of the Jordan start to say, hey, you're over on the other side say the Jordan, you have no part in God's people. This is a testament to your people that we do belong. We are part of you. And so they're like, we get it now. And so this miscommunication, this misunderstanding almost causes them to wipe out two and a half tribes. And so it, it's just a cogent reminder that these things, um, you know, these cultural things, these communication things, if we're not careful about them, they can cause real division among us if we're not patient, if we're not empathetic, if we're not listening um, and learning and trying to see the world from one another's perspectives. And so the first one, the first thing I want to highlight tonight is the element of sacred stories or in, uh, in a crown that will last, I, I use the term meta narrative. And a, a meta narrative or a sacred story is simply a, you know, uh, cultures have um, these identity bringing stories. They kind of, they become very important to who we are, how we operate in the world, how we see ourselves and our group and others. And you see an example of this in John chapter eight. And 
<clears throat> long about verse 32, that's where Jesus says, you know, those famous lines, if you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciple and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that sounds like such an encouraging statement. Many of us, you know, I know people that's like their life verse or they have it tattooed somewhere or something, you know, along those lines. And yet, if you notice the response of the Jews, they get very angry very quickly. In fact, they go from, it says, the Jews who had believed in him to just a few verses later, they want to kill him. That takes a special talent to have somebody, you know, a group of people who want to follow you one minute, want to kill you the next. So what is it that Jesus said that, you know, elicits that change that gets under their skin so quickly? And it's simply this, Jesus understood their sacred stories, and he intentionally pushes on them. And so for the Jews, their identity, the story that formed much of their identity was that they were God's chosen people led out of slavery in Egypt and brought to be a free people, God's people in the Holy Land. And so even if they were being subjugated by the pagan nations for a time, that was only short term. They were free because they were God's chosen people. And so when he says, you will be set free, he's pushing on that story. And they respond very quickly. We are Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. How dare you say that? We're the children of God. And then Jesus pushes on another meta narrative, another uh, sacred story. And he says, oh yeah, about that whole um, God is your father thing. I have bad news for you. In fact, he's not. Satan is your father. And so now he's attacked two of their sacred stories and they're ready to kill him. And, and that's how you do it. That's how you go from having a group of people want to follow you to a group of people ready to do you bodily harm in just a few minutes is you push on sacred stories. And a lot of times in a diverse community, when we get really good arguments going between one another, it's because we are infringing on or not understanding someone's meta narrative of their group, of their identity. Um, and so these, these, you know, when we don't understand these stories, we will misunderstand where someone's coming from. And so imagine, for example, you have a diverse group of disciples sitting around after a midweek and they turn on the news and they're discussing, you know, one of these, these issues, um, you know, George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery or some of the older ones, you know, Michael Brown and these things that get in the news and uh, are, are very, you know, tragic and controversial and all of these things. And someone starts to talk about, man, they've got to, and, you know, I, I really struggle with the, the police action in these cases, and it's clearly unjust. And someone else says, you know, well, if, if they would have just done what they were ordered to do, there wouldn't be a problem. And you start to get these sorts of arguments going on. And I, I'm sure you've, you know, been around one of these or heard of one of the, you know, these types of arguments between brothers and sisters. And now they start arguing the what's and the police are this, no, the police are that, and don't you, and the law, and, you know, if you just, and if you would just, and we start to argue about all these what's and try to convince each other, and it's never going to work, quite honestly. And what usually happens is the best case scenario is after a while, people go, you know what, let's just not talk about this anymore. We're just not going to bring this subject up again. Well, that's not a good solution long term. That is a foothold for Satan to get in there and attack our community. And so, but we don't know what to do because there's no way to navigate around these very different what worldviews that we have. And here's the thing, here's the stories underneath these what's and these beliefs and arguments that we have in these perspectives. When I grew up, I grew up in a world that very much everything around me, culturally and otherwise, told the story 
that policemen were the good guys. Just every TV show, every movie, every, you know, the policemen in our community would hand out baseball cards to the kids. We loved to see the policemen because we wanted to get our complete set of the Milwaukee Brewers cards that year. And, you know, Officer Friendly would come to our school and we were always told, you know, if you're ever lost, don't talk to strangers, but you can always find a policeman. They're the heroes. They help. They risk your li their lives for us. They protect us. They serve. They're, they're heroes. And so that becomes part of your identity, part of your story. My wife, on the other hand, grew up with a very different meta narrative in her community. Her family uh, is descended from folks who were enslaved in Mississippi. And back then, there were slave patrols whose job was to hunt down runaway slaves and to keep black folks that were enslaved in their place, keep them out of white neighborhoods and so on. And then even after slavery, the police forces really, in many respects, sort of followed that model and continued that um, form of policing. And that just has become what we as a society are used to. You see different philosophies of policing in, in different countries, but that's the one that sort of developed here. And so during the time of Jim Crow and separation and all that, these two different, very different experiences and views of the policing style continued. And it was, they were often meant to separate. And oftentimes the police forces in my wife's meta narrative of her family, they were the KKK at night and the police during the day. And you didn't know if you could trust them. They were not a source uh, there was no officer friendly in her neighborhood. You didn't, you didn't want to go with those people because you might never come back. And so I'm not trying to paint and say all police are bad or e even that all police are good. I'm simply trying to paint a scenario here of two different community stories that are then embodied and that becomes your reality. And even if you're removed from uh, the context the meta narrative still stays and it continues to um, inform how you interpret situations. If I have a bad encounter with a police officer, I'm going to say that guy was having a bad day, but I know police officers are heroes. Someone from my wife's family or community might encounter a police officer that's not a good interaction and say, see, I knew it. I knew that they were like, because the meta narrative informs it. Now, I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. I think there's truth to both. But what we as disciples have to do is when somebody is expressing some of these things that, that just enrage our passions and we start to go, no, you don't understand. Or what are you talking about? I think that's the time to step back and go, maybe there's some meta narratives being pushed on here. Let's go below the surface and try to find out why. Instead of arguing the what, why do you feel that way? Why do you think that way? Let me be all things to all people here. Let me put your interests ahead of my own. Let me hold off and, and recognize that maybe this anger welling up in me is just like those Jews in Acts chapter 8 because I've had a meta narrative stepped on. And so, you know, that's just one example of some of the work that we have to do to be in a diverse community. That doesn't mean that we'll see it the same way, but I think it will form a great deal of empathy to understand what each other experienced growing up. And then we can start to have maybe productive conversations and go, oh my goodness, I, you know, I, I, I never viewed the world from that perspective. I never thought of it in, in that light. And so it's important to do that. Um, another obstacle let me move on to another one here that can uh, become big in these uh, in diverse communities is that we have a lot of folks who come from an individualist culture and a lot of folks who come from a background of a collectivist culture. Now, broadly speaking, and there are always exceptions and some people, you know, there's 
things other than culture and many streams of culture. And so there's always exceptions. But broadly speaking, people who find their roots in Western Europe tend to be very individualist in their culture. Uh, most of the rest of the world is collectivist in their culture. And, uh, you know, for example, if you turn over to Philippians chapter 2, and I, I won't be able to get any feedback from you tonight, but I'm just going to um, read verse 12 and 13. And it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, here's the thing. Most of us, without even realizing it, have been trained to read the Bible in a very individualist way. Because here's what we do. And there may be some, a lot of exceptions out there, but we read that verse and we go, oh my goodness. I have to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. That is not what Paul is saying. Paul is a collectivist thinking cultured person writing to a collectivist culture church. He's just told them that they must be completely unified, have the same mind as Christ Jesus, put the interests of one another first, uh, behave like Christ in the world. He didn't reach for his own advantage, but he tried to push other people ahead and lay down their rights for other people and all of that. And then he says to this collectivist thinking culture, work your, or if we're down South, y'all's salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, now live this out, work it out with fear and trembling because this matters to God. So it's not some individual threat. Hey, you better get your salvation worked out. It's a call to the culture, to this community, to live out what he's just told them to do. So the Bible is very much rooted in a collectivist culture. The individualist culture has its roots in ancient Greece, uh, mostly, and it goes in through Europe, and then we've inherited a lot of it. Um, and there are differences. I'm not saying one is right or wrong, although, uh, again, um, there are a lot of aspects of biblical Christianity that we're going to have trouble embracing if we stick to a strictly individualist or even hyper-individualist culture. But here are some of the differences. In an individualist culture, the highest value is self-responsibility and identity. Um, nothing can be bigger than the individual. Circumstance can't be be bigger than the individual because I can overcome. If I work hard enough, if I have enough responsibility and discipline, I can overcome it. There can't be a system bigger than me. There can't be a structure that I can't overcome as the individual. And the greatest sin in the individual culture, so to speak, is to put a burden on others. Circumstances, especially bad circumstances in the individual's culture, are seen as internal. If something is going wrong in my life, it's my fault. I didn't work hard enough. I didn't do it. That's my responsibility. Uh, that's the individualist culture. Again, I'm not saying it's bad or wrong, but that's how we view the world. And I very much grew up with that perspective. Collectivist cultures uh, are different. Collectivist cultures, the highest value is caring for everyone in the group, regardless of circumstances. And negative circumstances are often seen as external for a collectivist culture. So if something bad happened, then we look outside. We don't blame the individuals. We don't, we don't worry about what happened. We don't say, well, let's sit down and talk about how you got yourself in this situation. The group is simply there to help. No questions asked. That's what community does. And so you can start to see how that would, I mean, imagine those two cultures trying to run a benevolence committee together. Good luck, right? Because you're going to ask very different questions and have very different perspectives on who needs help and when they need help. And, and it could really be offensive. And, and my wife's had to help some folks um, in our benevolence committee understand that, you know, when, when they go in and start saying, 
Well, let's examine how you got in this situation without realizing it. That's very hurtful and offensive to somebody who comes from a collectivist culture. It's, it's sending a very clear signal, you're not part of the family. This is business. And, so, and that's not, of course, what the individual person is trying to communicate. They're trying to be helpful and loving, but they're communicating something different to this person from another culture. It can even impact how we see, you know, things like racism. Um, th there's a big difference there. Um, let me talk about the individual's culture. Everything is an individual action. Therefore, when an individualist cultured person hears the term racism, the way we interpret that is what that means is I don't like somebody because of the color of their skin. I treat them negatively or differently because of the color of their skin. End of story. Individualist people are anti-structural, as I mentioned, in our worldview. So there can't be a system bigger than the individual. So if you start talking about things like systemic racism or a, a you know, system of oppression for hundreds of years that have made society unequal, uh, that's like telling me, you know, that's like asking me, what does blue smell like? I don't have a category for that in my mind. I don't have a category for a structure that becomes bigger than individual responsibility and opportunity. And so because individualists are individual in their worldview and anti-structural, the solution in our minds then to something like racism is very clear. It's relational. It's individual and relational. And so you will hear individualists say things like, I can't be racist because I have black friends, or I have Latino friends, or I have Asian friends. Therefore, I'm not racist. That drives collectivist culture people insane. Like, whoa, what are you talking about? Because they're operating on a different level. People from a collective culture tend to see more of, again, the external forces, the structure and system. And so that's how they view the world. And so when they talk about racism, they're talking about a structure of oppression, not necessarily individual prejudice. And so then the solution for a collectivist is always a group solution. The individualist says, don't you dare blame me for something that another group of people did. The collectivist says, how could you not take responsibility for what your group did? That's, that's what human beings do. And so without realizing it, we have these very different cultural worldviews that are driving deep wedges in between our ability to communicate. Um, and, and we can't even move forward. Um, e even another aspect of that is, um, you, you know, if something tragic happens in the news to someone and it's say, uh, you know, a person of my racial group, I think, well, that's too bad, that's sad, I pray for the family and that's about it because I'm an individualist. For my wife, when, when the George Floyd murder happened, because she's from a very collective community and culture, that was her brother. That was her son. That was her uncle. And she grieved in that manner. And she saw it that way and responded that way. And so a collective culture will do that nationwide, tend to. Again, everybody is different and has you know the different parts that they embrace and, and and their own uniqueness so i'm speaking in archetype generalities here but it's these this individual and collective culture if we don't understand that in a diverse church we're going to have issues obstacle number three um politics <laughs> but you know what it, it really comes down to this it comes down to allegiance. I'm not going to sit here and say one set of politics is right, one is wrong, this and that and the other. In Romans 10, 9, um, in fact, I'm sure you all know that verse well, but let me just uh, read it here. It says, um, if you declare with your mouth, 
Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul's not really talking about the process of salvation here. He's talking about the process of allegiance. Because in the first century, in the Roman Empire, the word that we translate as gospel, the good news, right? In Greek, it's euangelion. Do you know where that word came from? It wasn't a religious word. The Romans used it. They used it for proclamations about Caesar. When you had good news about a Caesar, you went and you sent heralds out to the rest of the empire to declare the euangelion. And the early Christians say, yeah, we're going to take that word. We're going to use that. The Romans talked about repentance. It was a often used a military word in the first century. And the way they used it was you would, if you were fighting for one army or one king, and I'm now, you know, going to come against your army, I would call you to repent, come over and give your allegiance to me, fight for me, or you will die. You know, so change sides, change allegiances. That's the way they used repent. The early Christians take that word. Uh, it was common to say Caesar is Lord and to pledge your allegiance in what was called a Roman sacramentum to Rome. The early Christians say, no, you are changing allegiances. When you say Jesus is Lord, that was not a, a warm, fuzzy little uh, religious phrase. It was a deeply subversive phrase. Jesus is Lord, and in parentheses read, and Caesar is not, neither is Rome. Now, if we want to hear the way that their first century word, I'm sorry, the way their first century ears would have heard those words, I think we would have to say something like, standing at our baptism, I pledge allegiance to his kingdom and to him as king alone and nothing else. Now that starts to sound a little subversive and a little challenging and a little stepping on some toes, right? Uh, for our ears. That's the way Jesus as Lord was taken. And so I think the reason, and I, and I don't have time to go into this in detail, but, you know, uh, politics separates us. And, and one of the things um, that, you know, is a factor in politics is that individualist and collectivist culture. We're going to have very different political instincts on what should be done and how to solve things and all of that. But let me ask you this. Think about Jesus' followers. He had Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector. These are the two opposite political streams that you could possibly have in first century Judea. You have a collaborator with the pagan empire and a zealot who wants to take up arms and wipe out the Romans. How could they possibly be in the same group, share all the experiences, share their lives, support each other? I'll tell you how they didn't do it. I'm certain that they didn't do it by just not talking about politics. You know how they did it? They dropped their allegiances. That's why the gospel writers mentions it to say, look, these guys, these two extremes dropped their allegiances to follow Jesus because they were allegiant to him as king alone. We, we have so many divisions because many of us have smuggled in other allegiances with us to Jesus when we came to Jesus. We smuggled in nationalistic, political, materialistic, ideological, you name it. We smuggled in other allegiances, and now they cause problems because we have these competing allegiances. And I put it this way, simply, if somebody were to come up to me and say, you know, hey, the, the L.A. Kings are the best hockey team you know, in the world. I, I don't care. I don't care about hockey. You could think that, whatever, okay, you know, fine, great for you. Now, if you say the Lakers are the best team in the NBA, now we're going to have a discussion because everybody knows that it's the Milwaukee Bucks. And that's just plain and simple. Now, 
and I'm going to be annoyed by the Laker stuff because I'm allegiant at a sports level to the Bucks. And so one of the things when, 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 you know, we go online or something and we see somebody post something political, um, my instinct is like, oh, I feel so bad for that person. They still have allegiances that they need to work out. It's going to be painful. And I'll patiently try to help them as much as I can. But I don't get mad about it because I have given up my own allegiances. So if I'm getting really mad, it's probably because I have my own allegiances that I haven't dealt with. I'm not saying always, but that might be a pretty good indicator. And I think there's a lot of situations out there of where we need to go back and read Matthew 7 again. I see the speck in your eye, but I got a big old plank of political allegiance or national allegiance or whatever in my eye. And so I'm caught, I can see your allegiance and your hypocrisy and your this and that, but I don't see my own. And so we are going to have problems culturally and as a diverse kingdom if we do not learn to deal uh, with these uh, emotions. And, uh, you know, this, that's why I, I wrote the book Escaping the Beast, Politics, Allegiance, and Kingdom, to try to um, urge us to look at this uh, a different way. Um, you know, and, and so that's one of the things is when we study the Bible with people, um, we're really good at studying out individual sin. Let's study out your, your lust and your pride and your greed. But why do we not look at some of these things that are causing the most division? Why do we not look at our political allegiances, our, uh, our racial attitudes, our materialism? Why are we not looking at these more meta societal sins that we just sort of smuggle right on in with us and don't question? And it comes down to this. I had a, um, a young brother that's here in the Two Cities Church. He's a young black brother. He's a good friend of mine. He's, he's actually a single brother. He's lived with us a couple different times for several years. And he was reading my new book, Escaping the Beast. And I said, how's it going, man? He said, man, I read the first 12 chapters. I had to read them again because I hated it. I hated it, dude. And it was it was like I didn't like anything in it. And I thought he was kidding. I thought he'd be like, ha ha, I'm just kidding. And I said, oh, and he goes, no, for real. But the second time I went and read it, he said, I wept the whole time. And he said, all 12 chapters, he said, because I was shook. Because I realized that there were allegiances that I brought in with me that I never dealt with that were deep in my heart that I did not want to give up. And then I felt bad that I had not given my full allegiance to Jesus. I hadn't even examined these areas of my heart. I think we've got to examine these. We've got to talk about these, but it starts with allegiance. Here's the last thing I want to mention tonight, last potential obstacle is, man, even our faith we approach differently from different cultural perspectives. And I want to, um, I want to show a short video um, to you that will... Uh, I think sort of sets this up and uh, you, you just, just watch it. You'll kind of enjoy it. It's a little bit funny. And then I'll explain um, why uh, I'm showing the video and the exact point I'm making. So I'm just trying to set everything up here. Hopefully you can see my screen in a minute. Um, I'm doing it. Sit down and just kick it with the people. Check it out. Just some random dude. I don't even know who he is. We just start kicking it, and look what happens. Let me talk to the brother right there. Yeah, yeah. What's your name, bro? Daryl. I'm gonna need you to slow down with your rap, bro. <laughs> For real, you're scaring the white people. You can't do that, Daryl. I'm sorry, bro. You're scaring me too, though. <laughs> wow. Well, what do you do for a living, Daryl? I work at Oak Ridge Military Academy. I'm the music director there. Musical director at Oak Ridge Musical Academy. Okay. Yeah. But you got a deep voice, man. I would not want to get you mad. Jonathan, come here. You're like, oh, snap. Nine Jonathan show up. It's amazing, dude. 
So you're a musical director. Ooh. Yes, sir. All right. So um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me hear. We didn't plan this. Just so y'all know, we didn't. We didn't plan this at all. I'm just randomly talking. To, go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, once you give me the version, is if. Uh, your uncle just got out of jail. You got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound Saved a wretch like me. I was lost, but now, right now, I'm found. Was blind, but. Okay, were, were y'all able to see that okay? So, um, I, I love that, I love that little clip. And we played that uh, a year or two ago uh, for our worship team, uh, a couple years ago, because we were encouraging them to diversify, you know, some of the song selection and some of that. And they weren't quite getting it. They were putting in other songs, but my wife was explaining it's more than just song choice. It's, it's the, the reason, the way, it's the whole approach of it. And what she was trying to explain is, uh, and this is just a, 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 sam a sample. I'm just using that to sort of signify the bigger difference in the way we can approach faith is collectivist cultures, like the one my wife grew up in, especially African-American culture, um, worship is often seen as coping with the pain and injustice of life. That, that brother sang that second version. That was his testimony, as my wife said. That's, that's the pain. That's you speaking to God and connecting with God and saying, this is my testimony. I'm not just singing to, you know, praise or even explain some doctrinal truth. I am testifying to God who has got me through the pain of life. Um, for the collectivist cultures, politics are good to talk about at church. That's the assumption with the culture. That's what you do at church. Uh, the group perspective is vital. You, you want to hear others' perspective on the pain and suffering and politics and let's work out together how we're going to approach the injustices of life. That's what faith is about. But for individualist cultures, faith is, tends to be doctrinally oriented. Its value is for personal guidance to help me be a better person, to help me get closer to God. That's kind of why I come to church in many respects. And we might not say it so blatantly, but that's kind of in that cultural unconsciousness. Um, and because the emphasis is on the individual, you don't bring up subjects that would make the individual uncomfortable or have to adapt to the group's perspective. Therefore, we stay away from controversial topics. That's the assumption of the individualist culture. So again, this is challenging stuff because if we don't talk about it, we will just have these wide differences that we're unable to bridge if we don't have communication. 
So that's some of the stuff that the next week uh, of the crown that will last will go through and delve into that and call, call us to think through some of these issues and how we can communicate them and overcome them. And I'm going to go ahead and stop there. And I think we're going to go into the Q&A. Amen. Well, it's great to uh, it's great to have a, a good five weeks here with Michael Burns, and uh, I'll, I'll share a little bit more uh, later, Michael. But we're just so grateful to have you. Uh, it's been it's been an incredible time and, and great discussion. And just as uh, and hopefully everybody hears me okay. So uh, I know after last week, uh, uh, raise your hand if you hear me okay. So uh, um, I think part of the Zoom etiquette we should add on, don't put a uh, water bottle in front of your mic before you're speaking or something like that. So um, anyway, so uh, we've got a, a couple questions when I, we're going to ask, and uh, I'll share a little bit about at the end. Um, and uh, just as we're, as, as you're, you're sending some questions, uh, I know um, uh, Spencer, uh, you're going to be up afterwards, but uh, and just uh, let us know uh, if anybody has any more questions. But I, I have one for you, Michael, uh, because uh, what I, I feel like is it's been great because it's it's uh, it's not just um, application for racial diversity and and things like that, and but um, I just see it as uh, also um, in in a lot of our relationships, like marriages, you know, uh, young marriages. Half, half the battle is learning each other's culture and what they grew, and, and half our arguments are, are not like we don't love each other, but we're just, we're just trying to say the same thing, but in different ways. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, like Anna and myself, although we both look Asian, I grew up in 90 something percent uh, white uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, and Anna grew up in East Oakland. So, so that's, that was our, uh, that was our clash at the beginning, but, uh, but as we're uh, as we're um, receiving a couple questions, Michael, maybe you can speak to how some of our young marrieds and and or or any marriages can can really learn and what 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 we should be doing to apply and, and understanding each other. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, and, and that's why you know when we do uh, when my wife and I when we do a full like a crossing line workshop, one of the whole sessions we do is on culture. And most of the illustrations we use from our own marriage. And to the point of it was never our intent, but we've had a number of uh, churches now in the last couple of years ask us to come do marriage retreats just on culture and, and work through that. Because, um, you know, one of the examples I give, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember if I gave it here on one of the midweeks, I, I probably didn't, but in case I did, sorry. But my, you know, when we were newly married for years, my wife would come to me and this seems so simple, but she would just walk up and be like, will you scratch my back? And it drove me nuts. Like, it, I was like, my wife is so rude because, and, and I know y'all feel me on that, right? Because I was like, you don't just come up and ask me directly to do something for you. Like that's sort of offensive because now I'm socially obligated to say yes. And, you know, you should do it the normal human way, which is to come up and say, my back itches. Now that's a proper social request. I can now offer to go ahead and scratch your back for you and be the hero, or I can just ignore the request and, you know, no, no face loss. Nobody's embarrassed and, and let's move on. And, and I, it was reinforced for me how, how much that culturally was passed on to me uh, recently uh, when escaping the beast came out my mom wrote me a message on facebook and said oh um where can i order one of those books the new escaping the beast and i was like mom i'm gonna send you a copy and like that was not an actual like she was planning and ordering it that was a hint for me to send her a copy and i picked it up and i knew it right away without even now, on the other hand, though, that would that would drive my wife nuts because she would find that manipulative. So for years, I'm thinking my wife is rude. She's thinking I'm manipulative. And when we started learning culture, we realized, oh, you know what? She means to be respectful. And so what one of the big things we had to learn in our marriage 
um, was to interpret what the other person meant. A lot of the things that she does still feels off and rude to me and vice versa, but we now learn to interpret and give the benefit of the doubt and, and that respect to say, okay, in her cultural background, she's being respectful, so I won't let it annoy. And that's actually been very helpful. So that's just one way, but yeah, there's, there's, it's a huge thing for marriages. Um, whenever we pre council marriages or whatever, now we always spend an entire session just talking about cultural expectations. You know, sometimes you even come in with different expectations of what a wife is, what a wife does, what a, what a woman's role is, you know, like very different. We, we were counseling a couple where it, it was an African American woman and an African brother. And it's like, have you all talked about your cultural views of women and, and the role of women in marriage? And they're like, no, should we? And it's like, yeah, you really should. And, uh, you know, they found out some things before they got married, but they were able to work through them and figure that out. So just discovering it um, in an unpleasant way, you know, a year into their marriage or something. So, um, yeah, great question. I, I could go on for 45 minutes on that, but I'll just I'll leave it there. <laughs> All right, good stuff. Um, okay, so Spencer, um, let's turn the spotlight on you and uh, have you answer your question. Thank you. I just had a quick question. I just wanted to know uh, how did God guide you, help you develop your perspective uh, on culture, politics, and ethnicity? And if that's too broad, then I just wanted to know more about your education and Sure. Uh, um, yeah, I appreciate the question. I mean, multiple streams, right? And you, you, you look back, and and I think this is true for most anybody. And you see God working in your life and preparing you in ways that you didn't recognize at the time. You would have uh, never known. And so, you know, part of it for me was being a historian, and I learned to uh, maybe think about things and. Um, approach the Bible and, uh, is it us? Is that me? In a, in a different way um, and think about it differently than a lot of, you know, ministers who went to se seminary. I, I, I approach the world like a historian and you dig apart and you analyze and you look at things. Uh, and so that was a part of it. I think, um, you know, certainly um, being married uh, to my my wife uh, was, you know, a part of that and having to learn um, the different culture and, you know, with my sons and teaching uh, for almost 10 years at an inner city school and coaching basketball, I learned a lot of things that are, are applicable to that. But I, I think it was um, 2004, I uh, decided to go into the full-time ministry. I was kind of talked into it. And again, when you think about the timeline there for our family of churches, early 2004 is a really odd time to go into the ministry. Um, and yet that's when I went. And uh, but at the time, I was like, if I do this and I'm, I want to go into seminary, I want to be I want to have training. And so I worked on a master's and one of my emphasis was in cross cultural ministry and communication. And so that kind of started it for me. Um, as far as culture, I think as far as history um, and the, the racial element, that really came out of, you know, I was always very passionate about that time period of American history from, you know, the colonial period up through and following the Civil War and some of that. So that sort of combined. Um, and then the, the last, uh, you know, 15 years of spending so much time uh, traveling around the continent and being very blessed to be able to do so in Africa and experiencing so many different cultural stories and experiences there and seeing things from a very different perspective. I talk about that in some of my books. And then um, I uh, have continued. I'm, I'm a doctoral candidate right now. I'm working on uh, biblical and theological engagement with an emphasis in uh, cultural engagement. Um, and so um, hopefully that answered your question. 
All right, so, uh, and we have one from uh, Brian Plymel. So, uh, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Michael, really have uh, gotten a ton out of your book. I love the way that you put it together and build uh, just a very powerful case on how from the beginning God's brought us to this point of being nation gatherers and how uh, becoming all things all men and, and the, the whole, everything you've done here. And that what, what uh, has been sort of, uh, uh, run around in my mind as we talk about this cultural cross-cultural understanding is um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the concept of cultural sins and how collectivist cultures or individualistic cultures or American cultures um, where those uh, where where accepting a culture or understanding a culture stops and where sin starts and how we how we deal with the sinful side of cultural differences while still being unifying and, and loving. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's a, a good question. And, and I think I, I, I'll give a brief answer. It's hard to dig into that uh, in depth, but uh, you know, I, I, uh, I look at like the uh, Romans 12, one and two. And Paul says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. And, and I combine that with 1 Corinthians 9, where he's talking about being all things to all people. And I pull some principles out of that. And I say, first of all, if we're not conforming to the patterns of the world, then we have to examine some aspects of our culture. Some aspects of our culture are not good. And that takes discernment. It takes scripture. Um, you know, if we look at the hyper individualism of the West, that cuts against a lot of what we're called to, you know, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26 is really calling us to take on a collectivist view of the body of Christ. Like, hey, we're all in this together and we need each other and we operate together. Um, we've been in cultures, uh, you know, some, some places where uh, the husband does not engage with the children. That's women's role. And that's just culturally the way it is. And so that's, we've had to challenge that and say, that's not biblical. You, you've got to drop that. Um, that's not okay. There are, uh, I have a friend who lives, um, in an Asian country and he tells me that lying is very accepted there. It's, you know, you save face, you don't want to embarrass somebody. And so lying is just a normal part of the culture. And so, you know, I've talked to some of the churches over there and they're like, yeah, it's, it's an issue. Um, there, uh, there's, uh, a place, a country in Africa where a brother that I know, um, spent about 12 years there in the ministry. And he said, it's so part of the culture that when we studied the Bible with the young ladies, we didn't ask them if they had an abortion. We asked them how many they had. And, and that was just part of the culture, something that they had to address. And so I, I think there's elements where we don't conform. We have to look at, you know, things that don't match up with the Bible and leave those behind. Then there's the expressive parts, the, you know, the good parts, the internal parts of culture that we embrace and we be all things to all people. And as we're not conforming and we're embracing, we are then transforming to become this new culture in Christ, which is a, a Christ focused culture that includes all, but there definitely has to be um, some work in on that. And Right before you asked your question, I just saw it go on the bottom of the screen in the chat, and somebody asked me, or, or asked, not me, but just asked about a, a podcast. Uh, I do have a podcast. It's, uh, it's, you can get it on Apple and Spotify and uh, all of those, you know, uh, Pandora. Um, but it's, it's called the All Things to All People podcast with Michael Burns.